Praise the Lord. Thank you, guys. Praise the Lord. Somebody shades here. Is yours? Yes, sir. <laughs> praise the Lord. Thank you again to the Magnolia team for coming over and helping us out. Give me a praise the Lord. Just uh, pulled up the church. There was an accident just out front, and Jerry Pippen, our keyboard player, who's usually here playing on the left, is they got rear-ended out there just a while ago, so be praying for him. They're going to take him out and check him. He's been through a lot here recently with some head injuries at work and stuff, so this just complicates things. So put Jerry on your prayer list. Let's just believe God to touch him, amen, this morning. And let's just pray for him right now, could we? Lord, we as your people come with a concern about a, a brother and part of our family and fellowship and ask you just to touch his body physically right now, Father, and to restore him completely. And just bring healing to him, Lord Jesus, and minister your peace, your grace, your life to him. And God, just uh, comfort he and Tammy both in this moment in time and protect all that were involved in that. We want to give you the glory because we believe you answer prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. We're in a series of messages called Dealing with Habitual Sins. In fact, this is number three in the series, which is also the final sermon in the series. Some of you are thanking God for that. So <laughs> it'd be just easier if you go ahead and deal with the habitual sin. Amen. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Listen, we talked about this series. We've asked you to be prayerful and to be committed in hearing these messages to the point that whatever it is in your life that you may have been losing the spiritual battle in, that you'd make a committed, disciplined effort to attack those things for the glory of the Lord in your life so that you're the victor and not a victim here. Because God wants us to live as victors in our spiritual walk in life. Just to kind of review a little bit before we finalize this sermon series today, as we look at this, this is not working again. So you want to fix that for me? I appreciate it. In Hebrews 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Now, that's an important scripture for us as believers, because what it's telling us here, one, that which we already know, there's a race that we're in. Christian life is uh, it requires commitment. It requires effort. It requires discipline. It requires faith. But praise the Lord. Things that it really takes are much more than what we have, and that's where God comes in and gives us what we need, our strength, our peace, our courage, our victory, our forgiveness. But we do have some commitments that are involved on our part of running the race, not being entangled, not letting situations and sin come in our life and defeat us and easily rob us of the victory that is ours. So there's a couple of key phrases we've talked about in this whole, whole sermon series. Phrase number one is this. You're going to have to, if this is not working, you're going to have to run it for me. But the key phrase here, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. The second phrase is this, the sin which so easily entangles us. One, we're in the race, but there are things which will seek to hinder you in your spiritual walk and in your life. And I believe as Christians, the Holy Spirit is very capable of showing us what those things are. But we have to be determined in our own heart to recognize and to be honest about the things that, that hold us up. When people see a sermon series like this titled, you know, Overcoming, Besetting, or Habitual Sins, they all too often think of the worst scenarios and think, well, that applies to the guy that's a drug addict out here. That doesn't apply to me. Or it applies to the guy who has a problem with alcohol. It doesn't apply. I don't have a problem with those things. But I can guarantee you, all of us are fighting on some level, on some issue that Satan wants to kind of come in and establish a stronghold in our life to keep us from really being effective in our Christian walk in life. Those issues, it may not be the alcohol, it may not be the drugs, it may be your tongue, amen. You may have a problem with gossip, it may just be, it could be something that's even an attitude that just cripples you in so many different ways. It's an attitude that's always negative. No matter what you're facing, it's negative. No matter what you have to do with it, it's negative. No matter how positive it is, it's negative. So there's lots of things, if we'll be honest, if we'll it, it, it get real with God, that God can deal with us about and, and take charge in our life, we can have victory in those areas of our life. But if we're going to sit back and form some kind of defensive posture and say, well, I'm just too spiritual for that, then we've already lost the battle. One thing that sin will do, it will cripple you in this race that you're running. And it will be like a heavy burden and it will cause you to stumble and continually fall. And you'll either do one or two things. You'll just bail out and say, I'm just tired of doing this. Or two, you just become real religious on the outside, but still keep the bondage in your heart. And that's not what God intended for your life. 
intend you to walk in freedom and to enjoy your spiritual freedom and your victory. Yes, you're going to, as long as you live in the flesh, you're going to struggle with things, but it doesn't have to be habitual things that keep over and over. You know, we just repent and confess and sin and repent and confess and sin, repent and confess and sin. That cycle, it's kind of crazy that people get caught into. The Lord wants you to walk in freedom in your spiritual life. So I want to just go over real quickly three things I said, three simple points about sin and what we said about those things uh, in regard to how it works in our life. We said, one, that sin has great power over our flesh. It's a real deal. And just because we give our life to Jesus doesn't mean we're going to have to, that we're just now absolutely free of those longings and desires and cravings of our flesh. They're still present. All right. And now one day, praise God, when we are either taken out of here by the rapture or we drop dead, we're going to be free from the presence of sin. Amen. Because we're going to be ushered in the presence of God. But until now, we're free from the power of sin. We don't have to succumb to its presence when it is there. We also understood that sin easily entangles us because it is so close. It's in our being. We've talked about you could decide that you're just tired of this sin battle and you're going to hide somewhere in a monastery or a cave and become a monk or whatever and abandon all of life and go hide out. Hey, it won't be long before you're going to discover that while you're there, sin is still there with you. It's just present. It's in our old nature. It's in our flesh. The third thing we says, it really, you know, you can't separate it. You can't say, uh, you know, well, here's my sin and here's my, 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 my righteousness and here's my unrighteousness. Like you can draw lines because Satan's always seeking through this present sin to entangle himself and in our flesh and in our attitudes and, you know, even in our motives at times. The Greek word it says where it's sin which so easily stands around us. What's he saying here? Hey, Sin easily stands around you. You know, you don't have to go far. It'll find you because it's near you and it's with you. The second thing we got into, well, let me give you the four points from last week. Then we'll jump into the final four points of this week. But very quickly, again, you're going to have to handle it for me. We said last week these four things. We found one, if you're going to win this battle, you cannot underestimate the power of sin in your life. All right. It's real, it's present, it steals your joy, it ruins your fellowship, it diminishes your fruitfulness, it robs you of your peace, it renders you useless in your spiritual service, it mitigates any effectiveness you might have for the Lord, especially in evangelism, it'll hinder your prayer life, and it'll certainly bring chastening into your life from the Lord, which you really don't need, all right? So that's going it, to, don't underestimate how important it is you deal with sin in your life. The second thing we said, we strongly purpose and promise, you're going to go back to the slide before that, okay? Strongly purpose and promise God not to sin. You say, I just don't know if I can do that. We talked about last week the importance of faith and believing God and trusting God. So with faith, we believe in our heart, but we also confess with our mouth. So there's a strong correlation. You're not just making a promise to make a promise. You're making a commitment to the Lord in faith. Lord, I'm not going to live this way in my life any longer. This is not going to be the course or the habit of my life anymore. I'm going to trust you. David the psalmist says it this way. I have sworn and I will confirm it and I will keep thy word. That's a pretty strong commitment, isn't it? I'm done with this deal in my life. The third thing we says, be suspicious of your own spirituality. Paul put it this way, let the one who takes, uh, take heed, uh, the one who stands, lest he fall. Don't get to thinking you're so spiritual that you're not going to stumble. Don't get to thinking you're so righteous that you're not going to have a failure in your life somewhere down the road. When you begin to have that kind of confidence in your flesh, then you've already messed up. Your confidence is always in the Lord. Your confidence is always in your heavenly father. The fourth thing we says in this context of all that's going on with habitual sins in our life, we need to learn to resist the first risings of the flesh and its pressure. We don't try to stop this process later on. We don't say, well, I'm going to think about this a little bit, but I'm not going to do it. Or I'm going to watch this a little bit, but I'm not going to do it. Or I'm going to, you know, no. You have to draw the line at the very beginning. You begin to sense that Satan's trying to draw you away to something. Your flesh is trying to entice you to something. Remember James said, every man is, is, is drawn away by his own desires and his own pleasures and his own desires and tries, calls it drives in one place in one scripture. And the King James calls it lust. But it's really anything that tries to draw you away from God's will and purposes for your life. So you don't sit there and you try to debate the devil. You don't try to sit there and think about it. You have to deal with it immediately. You have to say, it's stopping here. I'm moving in another direction. 
I'm going to move towards the Lord. Now, the fifth thing, which is where we left off, right on number four, but as we move to these last four points, the fifth thing is important. We meditate on the Word of God. And you know, at one time I had it written here, memorize the Word of God. But it's not just good enough to memorize. In fact, you can't meditate without memorizing, I don't think, because they're hand in hand. To meditate on the Word of God means that you're really going to get serious about this issue in your life. You're going to get so serious about what it is that's causing you to stumble, you're going to get aggressive. You're going to attack it. You're not going to wait for it to attack you. You're not going to sit around and think, I hope I don't have to deal with this today. Oh, God, I don't want to think about it. No. You're going to begin to get into the Word of God, and you're going to find out where in the Word of God God deals with these issues in your life. What are the biblical principles that, that deal with, with that particular problem in your life? And start memorizing those particular passages of Scripture. You're going to take those passages to heart, and you're going to memorize those, and you're going to personalize those, and they're going to become near and dear to you. Now you're taking on a whole new different attitude. You're not an escapist anymore. You're not running from your issues. You're running to the battle. But you're running the right way. Not with your mind set on, I'm not going to do something. Your mind is now set on truth. Your mind is set on the word of God. So it changes your whole perception of what is going on with you. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, the word of God is beginning to take root. David writes in Psalms 37, the law of his God is in his heart. So his steps do not slip. How do you want to have victory? How do you want to have a firm foundation? You put the law of God, the word of God in your heart. Psalms 119. How does a young man keep his way pure? By keeping it according to thy word. So you see how important it is to have the word. Now, you're not going to, you're not going to get the word into your heart and mind, you know, by putting it on your head. All right. That's not worth I have a friend of mine who told me he spent eight hours in the word every day every night until I went over to his apartment one night and saw these words engraved on his headboard, the word. And I realized why he spent eight hours in the word every night. And that's not a joke. That's reality. But you know, there's a lot of people think that they're going to get it by just coming to church or going to live group or coming on to Wednesday night. I mean, even doing all that together, certainly going to no. That's all important in our spiritual life, but the word is when it literally becomes part of your mind and your thought process and your life. It's ingrained now. Colossians says, let the word of God dwell in you richly. That, that's, that, that's a matter now where you are taking it in. You're, you're reading it. You're receiving it. You're, you're digesting it. It's becoming part of your life. How do you keep your, your way pure is the question. How do you win the battle? Verse 10 says, with all my heart, I have sought thee. Do not let me wander from your commandments. Thy word have I treasured, hid, kept in my heart that I might not sin against you. Now, up here on the stage, I have this glass, all right? I'm going to get a drink while you're watching. And you see, there's a, put a little, there's a lot of air still up in this glass, all right? Now there's a little bit more air in the glass. How do you get rid of the air in that glass? One might say, well, Brother Joel, let's put it in a vacuum and we'll suck all that air right out of there. Well, you do that, you're going to cause the glass to break. It'll eventually you just collapse with it. Well, how do you do it? We'll just put some more water in it. You fill it up some more. And that's where it goes out. D.L. Moody was using that as an illustration in a sermon one night when he said, you know, how you get rid of the air out of the glass. And, and he said, you know, what you want to do then is just take a pitcher of water and fill the glass. He said, all the air will be removed. He went on to explain it this way. The victory in the Christian life is not accomplished by sucking out sin in your life here or there. But victory in your spiritual life is accomplished by filling your life with the Holy Spirit. And the quickest way to do that is to fill your mind with the word of God. Why do we need to do that? Because our mind is so filled with air, with junk. It's filled with all the old stuff we lived with outside of Christ. It's filled with all the things from the flesh. It's filled with bad attitudes. It's filled with bad mindset. It's filled with bad philosophy. It's filled with bad worldviews. It's filled with bad relational views. All this stuff we've accumulated, it's like so much garbage. And the only way to sanctify or to cleanse that is by putting the word of God in. And the more that we put the word of God in and the more it becomes part of our thought process, it's amazing how the whole heart begins to change and the whole attitude begins to change. And we, 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 we walk in victory. Now, don't change them until I tell you, though, OK, because <laughs> it'll be ahead of me now. Number six, there has to be repentance 
if there's a relapse. And I'm not going to make a promise that there won't be a relapse. But you say, Brother Joe, I promised. And that's why if a repent, that, that's why if a lapse comes, then there needs to be an immediate repentance, an immediate brokenness. In Matthew 26, there's that scenario, do you remember, where, where Jesus is before Pilate. And he'd already told Peter, Jesus had, that you're going to deny me before the cock crows in the morning. In other words, before the morning alarm rings in the morning, which was the rooster, before he crows in the morning, you're going to deny me three times. Now, a lot of people want to immediately begin to put down Peter and he's so terrible and he walked with Jesus and he saw the miracles and he defected so easily and a little girl caused him to deny the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, before you so quickly castigate him, I want you to remember what that passage says in verse 75. It's a long chapter and it says there that, that Peter, upon hearing that rooster crow, became immediately aware of his sin and it says he went out immediately and he wept bitterly. That's what has to happen. That's how we have to kind of begin to look at our sin. That it, it, is, it is such failure in our life. It is, it is causing us a, such a, a tremendous gap in my fellowship with Jesus. Everything that Jesus did on the cross was for me to have a relationship, to have fellowship, and for me to enjoy my fellowship with him. All that sin does is try to eradicate that and to keep that from being real in my life. So that when it does come and when it is in my heart and when it's realized in my heart, there needs to be brokenness over it. God, I, I blew it. I'm sorry. Mention it. Name it. You know, be immediately about it. Don't put it off. Lord, forgive me. I don't want to do that again. That's, that's the stuff that real repentance is made of. That's, that's the stuff that, that, that shows a, a genuineness in our heart. So we confess it. And when we confess it, don't say, well, I'm sorry for that thing I did. You need to tell the Lord specifically. The Bible says if we confess our sins, that's a plural. It's a specific thing. I know I'm having services you, you've been in. Perhaps you've heard somebody stand up in the service and they pray a long, nice, you know, verbal prayer to the Lord. And it usually ends up with something like this. And forgive us of our many sins. You should have started with that, by the way. <laughs> That's, no, that's, that's not real confession. And I don't think it does us any good, nor does it help us on any level. Because what we need to do is we need to realize how serious these things are. We need to see this is a big deal. This is the thing that, 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 that's separating us and from enjoying our, 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 our love and our, our fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it will do you tremendous amount of good as it will for me that when sin comes, we say, Lord, forgive me for... And name it. In your prayer closet, verbally, out loud, be specific. Let your own heart, let your own ears hear the naming of that. Because in doing that, then you will develop a high degree of accountability. Now you can go to the next slide. <laughs> You'll develop an accountability in your own heart. So let yourself hear it. Number seven, continually take this to the Lord. Continually pray about this. I love Ephesians when he's talking in Ephesians 6 and he's talking about putting on the whole armor of God and he goes through all the elements of the armor and says, so you stand and he says, and having done all to stand, you stand. And the next word, anybody know what the word says? You stand what? No. Nope. Close. Praying. You stand praying. You do stand firm, by the way. <laughs> but you stand firm praying. You see, I got all dressed up for battle. I thought I'd get to go whip a sinner. <laughs> Maybe I can go, you know, Swing my sword at the devil. No, here's the way you, this is the, the ground in which you enter the battle. All right. Jesus told the disciples, you watch and you pray. For you do not know when you enter the hour, in, that the hour of temptation. You don't, you may not know. It could be tomorrow. It could be this afternoon. It could be Mount of Church. So you stay in an attitude of prayer. And just as I said, you would go into scripture and find some verses or some passages that deal specifically with whatever that thing might be that has beaten you up. You also take that very thing to the Lord. You take that to the Lord and say, God, you know I am weak right here. Name it. And you know where I've started. You know how many times I've failed. And God, I'm, I am as sick of this as anybody can be. And so, Lord, I'm bringing this to you. And when I pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, as it says in the scripture, deliver me from evil. This is what I'm talking about specifically. Now, I know there's other temptations, but Lord, here's the one. That I'm moving on. Here's the one I'm standing on you pro on your promises for. Here's the one that I want to enter into victory on. Here's the one I want to experience your grace on. And you begin to make this a matter of prayer. 
I think all too often when we have something that's like this, you say, how do you know? It usually comes from personal, you know, application here. The last thing we would do is to make it a, 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 a deal of a prayer that goes on in my life because it seems that the only time I would really play about it is when I'm saying, Lord, forgive me for it. Am I the only one who has that going on? All right. Y'all catch up in a little bit, right? Why don't we just take it to the Lord before it happens, not after it's happened? I say, Lord, forgive us our many sins at the last of the prayer. Lord, let's get to the front of the prayer. Let's don't end the day with prayer. Let's begin the day with prayer. And then if we begin the day with prayer, there'll be a whole lot confessing, less confessing at the end of the day with prayer. We can pray about other things at that point. But again, what are we talking about here? I think we're talking about getting aggressive, being determined, being committed and saying, Lord, you know, I'm going to I'm going to look to you today. I'm not not going to fight these enemies on my own. I'm going to trust you today. I'm going to engage the devil. Some probably some point about this today. So I'm going to trust you to be there with me. The Bible says in Colossians 4, 2, it says, devote yourself to prayer. That's a pretty powerful word, is it not? You get devoted to something. We say, if you want to devote to something, do you devote yourself to prayer? And as you do that, you'll see that the presence of God becomes more obvious in your life. A great theologian, author Pink, made, it, made the statement this way. We learn on a daily basis to practice the presence of God in our life. Hey, listen, if I begin to realize the presence of God in my life, I, I can be sure that when Satan makes his presence known, uh, I, I've already been practicing the presence of God. I've got what I need now. I can meet this. I can deal with this because I have him and I have his spirit and I have his word. I have everything I need, but I'm not going to be surprised. All right. I'm not going to be taken for a fool. I'm not going to be snuck up on. I'm going to be aware. I'm going to be on guard. I'm going to be a, be a person that's diligent. I call it anticipatory prayer. We practice an anticipatory prayer that says, Lord, you know, I'm looking to you today that as I come across these issues and this battle in my life, that I'm going to be aware of your presence as quickly and as most obviously as I am aware of my flesh's tendencies in these areas. So you're setting the course. Your prayers are setting the course for the day. Before the enemy arises, before your flesh has the opportunity to rise up and begin to entice you in that area again. Because some of these things, I said, they're so deeply ingrained. We've done it that way so long, you know, there may be some undoing. You didn't learn that behavior in one easy step. You kept repeating it and repeating it to become an, a natural process of your life to just do the wrong thing or to be the wrong way or to have the wrong attitude or to say the wrong words. Now there's going to be a new process of tearing down those strongholds by submitting them to Jesus Christ, by remembering his word, by taking it to, to, to him in prayer and by believing him. The eighth thing here is establishing relationships with other believers that'll hold you accountable. Now that's a big statement. Galatians 6 says, you bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Now, I say that's a big statement because we're living in a day and age where people do not want relationships. You know, they they really don't. You know, they, 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 they don't want to build relationships. They want to just go do their thing and let all these weird people leave me alone. I don't want to deal with them in the store. I don't want to deal with them there. I don't want to deal with them at work. I'm going to do my own thing. You know, I'm not, you know, like we said before, you know, in America, we used to put our porches on the front of the house. Now we put them in the back of the house because we don't want to deal with our neighbors. It's just the culture we live in. The Bible says that in the last days, men will be lovers of themselves. We don't care about anybody else. We love ourselves. And so much so, well, what brother Joe, I've been hurt. Well, join the hurt club or something. All right, get over it. There's got to be a club for that, okay? (laughs) But I've been disappointed. That happens in the world. But we don't stick our head in the proverbial relationship sands that hide us away. We begin to realize, hey, God has me here for a reason. God has me here to be interpersonal. God has me here to be relational. But sometimes we just run from it. And so we're living in this culture now where people really don't want to go to church even And if they do go to church, they want to go to a church that's just big enough they can hide in. That I don't have to do anything. Nobody's going to ask me for help. Nobody's going to ask me to serve. Nobody's going to ask me to do anything. They don't know who I am. I'm just kind of this anonymous Christian person who just kind of enters into that place and have no accountabilities anywhere and no relationships. And nobody's going to ask me, how you really doing? How you really doing? It's because none of your business. Well, excuse me. If you're my brother and sister in Christ, it's our business. You're my business. I'm your business. Amen. Amen. 
We have a necessity for fellowship. We have a need for relationship. And if you study the New Testament, you can't get around it. In fact, if you're not in church, you can't be right with God, according to what my Bible teaches. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, such as the manner of some is. And if you read the next two verses, three verses in the book of Hebrews, there's some pretty severe warnings about being that kind of person. But one of the, and the reason God says that, not only because we need teaching, we need instruction, we need corporate worship. It's a powerful thing when we discover it in our own heart and life that we come together. Some of y'all hadn't heard, learned that yet. You kind of watch everybody else worship, you know. And, you, you know, that's the kind of time to take the big step and open your mouth and join in. Uh, you, you've never heard me sing. I don't care what you sound like. And God doesn't care either. But God does care that if you don't sing. And you don't worship because you've nullified half of Proverbs if you don't do that. <laughs> Sing to the Lord, make a joyful noise. You know, what are you going to do with those, what are you gonna do with those scriptures? Yeah, you throw them out? I'd be better just to participate. But you, you need, you need other believers. Well, I don't believe that. Then take out half the New Testament. I showed you last week, remember, didn't we, didn't, didn't we go over that? Said, this is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Here's the New Testament. Let's get back to this part here. All right, here's the New Testament. Here's the Gospels. There's John. It ends right about here at the book of Acts. All right, that's, that's the Gospels. All right. But then God tells you how to live your Christian life after you've been introduced to the Gospel. And that's all that section there. And almost every one of those in that whole section there talks about your responsibility to be part of a fellowship of believers. That you have a gift. And God's giving you that gift for a reason. Not that you can say, I've got a gift, and here's what it is. The gift is not for yourself. It's for the Lord and for the body. And it is a divine, supernatural gift. You didn't come up with it on your own. You weren't even born with it. You're born again with it. All right. So if you just say, I've left out my church, not important to me. I don't need to be around other believers. I don't need to be fellowship. And I don't need, you know, I don't need responsibilities and, and services in the Lord's service. And I don't need a pastor. And I, I don't need elders and deacons and all that stuff and teachers and, and, and givers and servers. And none of that's relevant to me. I just need, I'm, I'm a little island myself. You are so immature. That's, that's the sweet way for me to say it. <laughs> all right. It's just, that's a level of immaturity in your life. You're going to have to get over that. And you got to go by, this is the divine inspired word of God, is it not? All right, well, I believe the Bible. Well, don't lie then. If you believe it, live it. And get involved where God would have you involved. All right? But if you miss that out, I can't imagine what it's going to be like to stand before the Lord. And Jesus says to you, you're my bride. Why were you so absent? And why were you so unfunctional in your gifts that I gave you? And why didn't you support the rest of your body as the bride? And where were you? Well, I've just seen too many people fail. Bear you one another's burdens. And so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ? To love. Amen. That's the law of Christ. We love, we care, we, we support, we share. Next slide, it's it this verse in Galatians. When he's talking about this in Galatians 6, he said, listen, if a man is caught in, here's the word peroptoma in the Greek language, which means a fall or a sin or they trespass. He said, you which are spiritual, you should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Each one looking unto yourself as well, lest you be tempted. First of all, if you're not active within the fellowship of the body of Christ, then how will you know if a brother stumbles or falls? You won't. Yes. And a little grunt at least, huh? <laughs> you won't. Or if you're just this person who's made an island out of themselves for whatever reason, well, I'm just afraid if they knew who I really was. Get over it. We're all like that. Amen. Amen. I could think that about my wife. She really knew who I was. She wouldn't like me anymore. You know? Amen. <laughs> so that's, you know, that's just, it's all excuses. You have a place in the body of Christ. I didn't write this book. He wrote this. These eternal, living, supernatural words from God. 
inspired, inerrant, infallible, ready to teach us, discipline us, instruct us in every form of our life. So I'm needed and you're needed in the fellowship to do our part that nobody else can do my part. Nobody else can do your part. So that if I do struggle and if I do stumble, you're there to put your arm around me, to lift me up, to help me, to see me get into healing in my life in a process of recovery in my life. I'm there for you when you fail in that regard to help you, to stand with you. Not to, in, not to point finger at you and say, well, I can't believe they did that again. That's why it says you which are spiritual. How do you know you're spiritual? Because your heart's broken when a brother stumbles. You're not looking to say, well, look at them. You're not pointing a finger of accusation. You're concerned, your heart's broken. You begin to pray for that person. You have a burden for that individual that they're not where they ought to be. They're not doing what they ought to be doing. They're not living the way God's called them to live their life. And so you're concerned about it. And so you reach out to them, how? In the spirit of gentleness. But you also realize humility dictates that they're guilty of that sin. Hey, it could be me tomorrow. It could be me tomorrow. And anytime any of us get to the place that, well, I would never do that, you're walking on dangerous ground. Because due to the nature of sin and to your flesh, you're capable of any and every sin. Well, I don't think I could ever do that. Let's put you in the right situation, the right circumstances. It'll be the wrong situation, wrong circumstances, but and see what you do. So we don't point fingers of accusation. We reach out, we encourage, we help. The Bible says to restore. That's literally the word which means to mend a broken bone. You set it back in place. Now I think some people don't like accountability because they don't want anybody touching their broken bones. That hurts. Leave me alone. I won't talk about that. Then they grew up crippled and deformed in some area of their life because they wouldn't rely on brothers and sisters to help them and encourage them. But I'll tell you, if you're facing an issue in your life in regard to besetting sin, then you need to find a brother or a sister who's been there. If they haven't been there, they're at least spiritual and they walk with God and they know how to pray. The last thing you need to do is find that church gossip and tell them though. <laughs> don't tell brother mouth or sister mouth alright he says spiritual people that's, again that's why you're so important you may not be struggling with this anymore it may not be an issue but there's somebody that is an issue and you're needed in their life the Bible says we comfort one another with the comfort we've been comforted with. What's that mean? You can help somebody where they're stumbling because you've been there. You know what that's like. And you, you found your way through it and you found your way out of it. But you get aggressive about it. You get on the attack mode about it. You say, this is where I'm moving ahead and moving forward and believing God and trusting God. And we're going to walk in this thing and we're going to see God do a great work. Now, uh, the last word, verse I want to share with you is that it's, it's the last part of this, this passage in, where he says, you know, we're looking unto Jesus who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, I gave you eight simple things here, all right? But I want, you, I want to tie them all back to this verse just very briefly. Hebrews 12, 1, lay aside the set again. How do I do that? You've got to change where you're looking. You've got to change the focus of your life. You're no longer looking at your failure and you're no longer looking at the temptation and you're no, lo you're no longer looking at anything else. And now you look, how do you look unto Jesus? One, you realize you're not going to underestimate the power of sin anymore. You're going to estimate that the power of God is sufficient for your life. So I'm not looking to sin now. I'm looking to save. Second thing we said, I'm going to strongly purpose God not to live that way anymore, not to go into that dead direction. Uh, what am I going to do then? The other alternative, and there's only one more. You're either going to look at that or you're going to fix your eyes on Jesus. And now you strongly purpose that you're going to keep your affections and your heart focused on him. And all the same while bearing an attitude, we said the third thing was be suspicious of your own spirituality, which means an attitude of humility. Because that's the only way you're going to really walk with Jesus. He says, you know, if you humble yourselves, I'll lift you up. You draw near to me, I'll draw near to you. So we're, we're coming to the place of saying, my eyes, my heart, my mind now is fixed on you, Jesus. I realize it in myself and on my own, I'm going to mess this up. I'm going to blow this. And if I think I'm going to win this spiritual battle and defeat my own flesh or even defeat the devil by me just buckling up and trying harder, that doesn't work. I need you. That's the missing element. I need God. Therefore, I'm looking to God. 
This makes it easier when we talk about resisting the risings of the first risings of pleasures of flesh and of sin when it starts sticking its ugly head up and drawing us to itself. You know, the immediate first thing we want to most of the time do is just all of a sudden we're going to pay attention to what's going on in our mind and our flesh. But what we need to do is no longer do that. Now we're going to fix our eyes and our attention and our affections on Jesus Christ, who is the author and who is the finisher of our faith. The sixth thing we said was we're repentant over our sins. I tell you, the best way to get repentant over your sins is to fix your eyes on Jesus. Amen. There's nothing more humbling than to get your eyes and your affection set on Jesus Christ in your life. I, th- I think that's why when we're real honest and that we see the Lord's Supper together, we have all our affections and all our attention and all our worship. We're just, it's all upon the cross and upon the blood and upon Jesus. It, it's such a humbling moment. You know, it gets us to realize we have a new heart of gratitude and gratefulness for all the Lord's done. Well, listen, when we get our eyes really fixed upon Jesus Christ, all of a sudden we become even more aware of the things that are not right in our life. And we, at that point, we be, oh, God, forgive me. Cleanse my heart and wash me. Well, I'm fixing my affections, my attention, my eyes on you. I'm getting in the word. I'm asking you for supernatural divine help. And I am establishing community and fellowship and relationship that is so vitally important in our lives. I will fix my eyes on you. Listen, it might be me going down the next time. It might be you. It might be the person sitting next to you. Now, I've been told that the Christian army is the only army in the world that buries the wounded. <laughs> That's not what we're going to do at Believer's Fellowship. That's not what we do at Believer's Fellowship. Amen. We seek to lift each other up. We seek to help each other. We seek to pray for each other. Yes. We seek to hold each other in a higher place so that God may be glorified in our lives. I think and I believe with all my heart that we can have victory over habitual sins in our life. But it's not just going to happen by osmosis. It just kind of happens if it happens. I, I kind of grow out of this sin in my life. It doesn't work that way. And I don't think it ever works our way in our life where we get down the road and I'm 75 years old and think I'm not going to have to deal with that again down there. You may well have to deal with it every day of your life. I think there's just certain things in all of our lives that, that we open a door to a propensity for a certain sin. And where Paul said it's like strongholds. But you know where strongholds are? And nothing more than in the heart and mind of an attitude that is unbiblical, of believing things that aren't truth, of believing lies that are contrary to what God says. And they told to us long enough, we start believing them. What has to happen is we start putting the truth there and rehearsing the truth in our heart and mind that we start believing it over what the world says, over what the flesh says. It's not mind control, it's spirit of God control as he gets control of our mind. And he transforms our life. Presenting our body daily as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable. That's our reasonable service. Then we'll be not conformed to this world. We'll be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Praise God for grace. Praise God we can be free. So I give an invitation today, this morning. Go ahead and praise the Lord. Amen. Not hurt. Let's stand together.